So as uh, Francesca indicated, our next speaker is Victoria Williamson. She's laboratory manager of the Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute located in Secu uh, Syracuse University, Syracuse, New York. Uh, Victoria will talk to us on as the first uh, customer of the forensic application, Depare and Forensic Science incorporation into the US standard workflow. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's such an honor to speak in front of such distinguished guests. And today I will be discussing the incorporation of the DEPRE into the US standard forensic workflow. But before I get started, there are a couple of disclaimers. Uh, this research project was funded by the National Institute of Justice, and the National Institute of Justice is a branch of the US Department of Justice. And the opinions, findings, and conclusions that I make today in my presentation do not necessarily represent those of the Department of Justice. And so, in 2014, the National Institute of Justice created an operational working group requirements, and the, there are nine requirements that the NIJ uh, saw as needs within the forensic science community as a whole, and we believe that the DEPRE can answer nine, all of these nine requirements. So these requirements include the physical separation of sperm from epithelial cells, differentiation of biological material from different sources, identifying invisible cells, or uh, identifying biological material down to the invisible cell. Uh, the DEPRE can also answer automated, uh, the need for an automated sperm searching and identification tool, and it can also improve methods uh, of processing biological material down to the single cell. And as we all know, the DEPRE can identify, isolate, and recover uh, individual cells from heterogeneous samples. This is particularly of use within forensic samples because they are primarily heterogeneous. They're heterogeneous in cell type, from sperm to epithelial cell or epithelial to white blood cell, or it could be a mixture of all three components. They can also be heterogeneous in source type from mixtures of cells from different donors. And so this heterogeneous uh, nature of forensics can be seen in sexual assault cases, and the pr primary evidence within the sexual assault cases are uh, sexual assault kits, and these in the, there are many different um, practices or current workflows with analyzing the, this type of evidence, but the current workflow includes the analysis of slides prepared by the sexual assault nurse examiner, also the um, analysis of swabs and clothing. And so the analysis conducts presumptive and confirmatory tests. And once they determine that DNA, uh, sperm is present, then they go down to DNA analyses. Uh, another method at determining the presence of sperm is performing a differential extraction. And this separates sperm from epithelial cells by lysing those epithelial cells and then going straight to DNA analysis. And if there's no DNA present in the sperm uh, fraction, then they must go back and analyze all of these samples again. And so these, this current workflow here is the most time-consuming aspect of forensic DNA analysis, and it's considered the bottleneck of all of, of DNA analysis within the US. And so we are determining, or we're going to substitute the DEPRE workflow based on this evidence right here. And so the DEPRE workflow consists of releasing cells from a substrate, staining and fixing those cells, preparing the instrument, and then routing and recovery of selected cells. And so time is a critical aspect in most fr in forensic cases. And we decided to break down each section into time. So for the cell sub substrate release, the hands-on time is approximately 30 minutes and the total time, depending on the sample, is two to 24 hours. Then cell staining and fixation is about 45 minutes hands-on time and two and a half hours total time. Instrument prep is also 30 minutes, both uh, hands-on and total time. Then routing and recovery also depends on the sample, is 30 minutes hands-on time and then three hours total time. And so currently, we can prepare four samples at one time, and it takes a total of five and a quarter hands-on 
time. This may seem like a lot of time, but we, there are many benefits from this time, and these benefits include the positive identification of human sperm, clean fractions prior to extraction, a known cell count. This is extremely important because we can completely eliminate a step, a required step in the current US forensic workflow, and it also enhances touch DNA sample processing. And so to further break down the DEPRE steps, at the cell substrate release phase, the two substrates that we use are cloth and swab, swabs, and we've determined that Dacron swabs are better at releasing sperm cells than cotton swabs, and so then we incubate our samples in a thermal mixer, and we change the protocol just slightly, so, so we, the protocol says to incubate the samples at 300 RPM, but we increased it to 500 RPM. We've determined that we uh, increase the presence of sperm and maintain the epithelial cell integrity. And uh, we've also included a size exclusion filtration step. And filtra filters are not typically used in forensics, but thanks to silicon biosystems, we've uh, been able to en enrich our, the sperm content within our samples by um, removing larger, or filtering out larger epithelial cells. And so during the cell staining and fixation steps, it's just standard wet bench work of four, five to 15 minute incubation periods. And the forensic application for the DEPRI training is very similar to forensic DNA training. And so we all know that the loading the sample into the machine is simple as loading the sample into the cartridge, then the cartridge into the DEPRI. And during the routing and recovery phase, we can identify and select relevant cells for recovery. And relevant cells include single cells or sperm clumps. And we also recover epithelial cells from sexual assault cases and touch DNA. And quality of the cell does matter, and I'll come back to that later on. And so for this study, we uh, have a bunch of samples from a variety of sources. The first is proficiency tests that we obtained from our local government crime lab. And uh, these cells are, were created, or these swabs were created from a uh, quality control agency. And then we were able to collect post-coitus samples, and the swabs collected were from 12 hours to 96 hours. Some other samples include um, mock samples that we created to represent uh, common forensic scenarios. These uh, substrates include underwear and cotton swabs of dilutions of sperm to epithelial cells from one to one all the way down to one to 10,000. And we are also looking into touch DNA from sub substrates of aluminum cans and light switches. And so once we recover those cells, we then proceed on to the DNA analyses. And uh, we've used the silicon biosystems extraction method, and this has many benefits. We, we avoid loss of cells from transferring cells. We can keep the cells in the, to the same tube. We avoid loss from the transferring cells through different tubes, and we also avoid laborious concentration procedures. Uh, another benefit is that we can directly add our amplification components straight into our extraction tubes, and the kits that we use are Promega PowerPlex 6C Fusion kits. And then after we amplify the DNA, we then detect it through the Applied Biosystems 3500 Genetic Analyzer. And we, for the amplification and detection, we use manufacture, manufacturer's um, procedures and requirements. And so the first sample that we recovered cells from was a proficiency test from 2002, so it's approximately 15 years old. And uh, the picture right here is a crude example of m sperm cells post-release of the substrate. And uh, we used, to identify these cells, we used a common forensic confirmatory test. Uh, it's called the Christmas tree stain. It stains the nucleus of sperm and epithelial cells red, and then it stains the tails of the sperm and the cytoplasm of the nucleus green, hence the Christmas tree name. And so this cell panel shows the positive identification of sperm. So DAPI right here, oops, 
is in blue, that's our nucleus, then PE stains our epithelial cells, and then APC stains our sperm cells. So we can uh, identify this as sperm based on the high intensity of uh, AP, uh, DAPI and then of APC. And so the, this picture over here represents the relationship of DAPI to APC, and we, cl we identified the uh, pre great presence of sperm positive cages. And from this sample, we, rec we recovered 188 sperm cells, which is approximately 0.62 nanograms of DNA. And it's important to note that in forensics, one nanogram of DNA is considered in a huge, extraordinary amount of DNA. You're technically swimming in DNA if you have a nanogram. And uh, so we were able to create a genetic profile from that sample. And uh, this is an electropharogram of a, of a good single source profile. The, it's good because the peak heights are of high intensity. The, the peaks are balanced as well. And there's alleles present at every loci. And like Francesca mentioned, these loci here are male-specific, indicative of, of sperm. And so uh, the, another sample that we recovered cells from was a 1 to 10 dilution of sperm to epithelial cells. And this picture here represents DAPI and APC events. And we were able to identify sperm cell events. And then over here is APC versus PE, and we were allowed to separate epithelial cells from sperm cells. And so from this sample, we recovered 10 or 7 epithelial cells, which is approximately 0 0.046 nanograms of DNA. And we identified, or the PE is identified right here in red, and the, these cells are slightly oversaturated, but the intensity is very high, indicating that these cells are present. And again, we were able to generate a genetic profile. The peak heights are slightly lower than the heights that we saw in the previous profile, but we are still able to um, determine that this is an epithelial cell, and uh, it's, still, it's still interpretable data that can be used in the, a court. And so the sperm from this sample, we recovered 174 sperm cells, which is approximately half an anagram of DNA. And what's unique with this sample is that we were able to recover, oops, recover clumps of sperm as well as single sperm cells. And then again, we, cr we generated a single source profile. And then the next sample we conducted was a 1 to 100 sperm to epithelial cells. We recovered 10 E cells. It's approximately 0 0.066 nanograms of DNA. And we, again, we were able to um, cr uh, create a genetic profile of a single source sample. And then the sperm, approximately 44 sperm cells were recovered, which is approximately 0.145 nanograms of DNA. With this sample, however, we um, have a mixture source, but we were still able to positively identify sperm as the major contributor because of the high peak intensity of these peaks. Oops. And so this type of profile is not uncommon in most forensics cases, especially if you're performing a differential extraction. You are going to get um, fragments of the, the female donor or the epithelial cell donor within your profile, but we are still able to, to um, say that this is a sperm profile. And so we just finished conducting a sensitivity study, and we are in the preliminary steps of, of analyzing our data. And this study included the four additional tests or runs of proficiency tests, totaling 31 recoveries. Each test is approximately 15 years old. And this table just summarizes the, the genetic profiles that we created. So the study consisted of in the collection of individual cells of individual groups of cells of one, two, and three cells. And the mean percentage of alleles per sample greater than 25 RFU at, for three cells is significantly higher than it is at one and two cells. However, 
at one cell, we were still able to uh, determine that 36% of cells were above the threshold of 25 RFU, and this is still interpretable, interpretable data that can be used. And again, these, so since sperm are haploid cells, this table is based on a full diploid profile, so the, um, the values reflect the full diploid profile, not the haploid. And so uh, we are also conducting touch DNA studies, and touch DNA is the, his DNA deposited through direct contact with the substrate and its skin. So it's essentially the act of touching an object and releasing or depositing DNA onto the, that object. And so this study is still in progress, but we definitely do see positive and positive benefits of incorporating the Depurate into the US standard workflow. We see it be benefiting in case types from sexual assault cases to touch DNA. And we definitely see the adaption of the Depurate into the United States, uh, the adaption very fairly quickly. Uh, this is due to the um, indirect uh, relation to DNA analyses. In the United States, um, techniques that are directly related to DNA analyses take, um, take a long time to be adapted due to the strict quality control regulations. And since the DEPRA is not directly related to DNA analysis, we see adaption fairly quickly within the states. And also, depending on the laboratory's resources, we see uh, the DEPRA can be used on high-profile cases as well as regular use. And customer service is extraordinary. We've experienced excellent support through the instrument and te technical support. And lastly, there's, we definitely see significant improvements and enhancements up to the analyses of forensic evidence. And uh, some acknowledgments. I'd like to thank uh, my professor, my colleague, and mentor, Michael Ma Marciano, who is also the primary investigator of this research, uh, the DNA unit at the Onondaga County Crime Lab, uh, the National Institute of Justice, and then everyone at Silicon Biosystems. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>